right? Amen. How many ready for the word today? Let's get on our feet. Are you ready? Let's go. Luke chapter number 8, the gospel of Luke chapter number 8. Amen. Luke chapter number 8. I'm going to read the words of Jesus today, Luke chapter number 8. I'm going to move this out of the way. The series is entitled, Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. And we are taking the words of Dr. Luke as he looks at the life of Jesus, and we are dissecting them as to how they apply to our life. So we're going to begin reading in verse number four. This is where we were last week, and I want to revisit this again. Verse number four, Luke chapter eight. If you have it, say amen. The Bible said that when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spoke by a parable that a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air, they devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and it sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried. He said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked and said, What might this parable be? And he said, to you it's known to give, or it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, hearing they might not understand. And the parable is this, the seed is the word. It is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then comes the devil and takes away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and should be saved. They on the rock are they which when they receive the word, they receive it with joy. They have no root, which for a while they believe, but in time of temptation they fall away. And then that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard they go forth they're choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and they bring no fruit to perfection but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart having heard the word they keep it and they bring forth fruit with patience amen will you lift your hand with me as we pray father thank you for the word of god i am asking lord for your anointing to flow through me today to say exactly what you want me to say and may you be glorified in jesus name we pray and everybody shout amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. How many want to learn something today? Let me hear you shout amen. All right, here we go. Let's dig in. This is a conversation we started a week ago. Started to talk about this parable that Jesus was teaching us. It is the parable that many call the parable of the sower, but in reality, it is the parable of the soil. It is not about the sower, and it's not about the seed. It is about the soil. And the reason that it's about the soil is because Jesus is talking to us about the heart of mankind. Now, let me ask you, how many believe Jesus is more concerned about your heart than he is anything else? It is very easy for us to fool everybody by what we do on the outside. We can do the right things. We can say the right things. We can act in a certain way and fool everybody into thinking that we are somebody that in reality we are not. I mean, look what the Bible says in Jeremiah. The Lord said, I search the heart, I try the reins, and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Now, the reason God is so concerned about the heart is because the outward appearance is not what qualifies you to be used by God. Amen. I mean, look at Samuel. He comes to Jesse's house with the assignment from God to anoint the new king of Israel. And Jesse's boys all line up. And they've got their finest suit of clothing on. They put on their Burberry cologne. They've got their hair combed just right. They've got everything that looks good. Samuel is the man of God. He is anointed. He has been given insight from God. But still, the Bible said Samuel is ready to take that bottle of oil and pour it over the head of the wrong guy. I don't care how spiritual you might be. How many know if you judge somebody by what you see, you might mess up? Come on, somebody. God has to stop Samuel from pouring the oil. He said, Samuel, stop. And here's why. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And Samuel, there's a young man that is not standing in front of you that has a heart that is after me. 
Acts chapter 15 said it is David. He is a man after God's own heart. And so today what I'm trying to preach to you and teach to you and to me is that God wants our heart before he wants anything else. Can I just tell you, God wants your heart more than your money. Now don't stop giving in the offering. But God wants your heart more than he does your money. God wants your heart more than he does your preaching. He wants your heart more than he does your singing. I don't care how talented, how gifted you might be. It doesn't matter if you're an orator that can move a congregation to tears. If your heart is not in the place God wants it to be, God said you are nothing more than a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Church, God wants to get to the root of our heart. How many believe it? Shout amen. That is what he is teaching here. So he's talking about the soil. He's talking about the receptivity of the heart of man to the word of God. Now, last week, we talked about the calloused heart. We talked about the heart, amen, that was on, that was on stony ground. We talked about the compromising heart. And today I want to go to the last two types of soil that Jesus was teaching about in Luke chapter number eight. And the first of which is this. I want to talk about the soil of the choked heart, the soil of the choked heart. He says in verse 7 that some of the seed fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And then he explains in verse 14 what that means, that that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard, they go forth and they are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to perfection. So Jesus is teaching that there is a level of soil that within the soil are weeds and thorns. And so as a farmer would go, he would have to make sure that the soil was free of every weed and every thorn. And the reason would be because the seed would be planted and the seed actually would take root and would actually go down into the soil. But as the seed would go down into the soil, if the thorns were there, the thorns and the weeds would wrap itself around the root of the seed, and the life of the seed would be choked out by the thorns of the soil. Now think about that for just a moment. The life of the seed would be choked out by the power of the thorns and the weed. Now, I've got some thorns that are up here, and this may be different than what Jesus was talking about, but I don't know about you, but I don't want a garden that is full of thorns. I don't want a garden that is going to take the life that is in the seed and wrap itself around and choke out the life of that seed. You see, my friend, the power of the Word of God is only as powerful as you allow it to be. How many believe the Word of God has power? How many believe the Word of God speaks life? How many believe the Word of God speaks healing? But you see, if there are things in my heart that choke out the power of the life of God and things and issues and thoughts that contradict the written Word of God, you can plant the seed, but if the seed is choked out by the other things that are in my heart, the life that God wants to bring will never come to fruition simply because we have allowed weeds and thorns to be in the depth of our soil. And the Lord is saying there are some that the word is planted, but yet the thorns are so real that the word is never able to produce the fruit that it wants to produce. Now, let me tell you something. How many believe God wants you to be fruitful? Amen. The only way to be fruitful is through the word of God. So Jesus defines, okay, so what are these thorns? What are these weeds? What is it that chokes out the word of God? Let me tell you what this is what he said. He said, first of all, it is the cares of life. It is the cares of life. So many times our heart and our mind is consumed with worrying about things that God has already promised that he's going to provide. How many believe the Word of God said that my God is going to supply all of your need according to His riches and glory? How many believe that? Shout amen. 
How many believe he's able to take care of what, put, put, what you put on your table and your job and your income and everything else that you are concerned about? How many believe God has already taken care of it? Let me hear you shout amen. But so many times what we do is we lay awake at night and we worry about the cares of life. We worry about the things that God has already taken care of. We worry about our income. We worry about our job. We worry about where, where our next meal is going to come from. We worry about the things that God said, I have already provided for you. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 6. He said, don't take any thought for your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, yet for your body, what you're going to put on. Is not the life more than meat, the body more than raiment, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into barns. Your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? How many believe you're better than a bunch of birds? Come on, look at somebody say, you're better than a bunch of birds. Which of you by taking thought, let me tell you, you worrying about it is not going to change anything. Let me address this right now. How many have worried about something and suddenly everything got better? No, it doesn't get better. Worrying about it only takes you down a road where the devil begins to manipulate your thinking and you now lose the power of the Word of God. If the devil can get you to worry more about your needs than you do thinking about his provision, he's got you backed in a corner. And I believe it's time for us to take the Word of God and say, no more devil am I going to worry about that which God has already said he is mine. He said, if my needs are met, I'm going to stand on his Word and I'm going to believe it, and I'm not going to let my mind be corrupted with the doubt and the fear that comes from the enemy. If the word said it is true, I'm going to stand on it. Somebody shout amen. It doesn't do any good to think about it. He said, these are the things that the Gentiles look for. He said, your heavenly Father knows that which you have need of. Can I tell you, somebody right now is listening to me, and the devil is doing his best to convince you that you are not going to make it. And I want you to do something for me. I want you to get in the Word of God, and I want you to find as many scriptures about the provision and the protection of God. And any time the enemy comes and tries to manipulate your mind and back you in a corner. I want you to come out swinging with the Word of God and say, devil, this is what the Word says, and I don't care how I feel. I don't care what my emotions or my thoughts tell me. I am standing on what the Word of God said. No, let me tell you, the devil cannot stand the Word of God. Even Jesus in the wilderness, when the devil came to tempt him, what did he do? He quoted the word. He said, it is written. If the Son of God has to use the written word, how many know I've got to use the written word? Get as many scriptures as you can. And when the enemy has you at 2 o'clock in the morning, lying awake, worrying about something in your life, and the cares of life, come out with the Word of God and quote it, and let the Word of God rise within you and bring life, because the devil's a liar. He only wants to bring death, but I speak life in the name of Jesus over you. He said it's the cares of life that rise up and they choke the power of the seed. It is the thorns of the care. What are you worried about? I want you to address it right now. What is it that you're worried about? I want you to put it right out there. I want you to stop hiding behind. This is going to stick to me. I'm going to preach with a thorn the rest of the time. I always knew I was a sharp guy. What is it that you're worried about? What is it that is front and center on your mind? I want you to put it out there and say, God, no longer am I going to let this sap out the life of the seed that is within me. Because if the word of God is within you, there is no, get rid of every thorn that would choke out the seed. And don't let the cares of life become more powerful than the Word. Now, he said not only the cares of life, but the riches and the pleasures of this life. Matthew 19, there comes a young man to Jesus, 
And he said, what good thing can I do that I can inherit eternal life? He said, why do you call me good? There's none good but one. If you enter into life, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? He said, do no murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father. Honor your mother. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, everything, all of these things I've kept from my youth up, there's one. What do I lack? Jesus said, go and sell what you have. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And the young man, the Bible said, went away sorrowful. Now, let me ask you this question. Was it wrong for him to have possessions? No. It became wrong when his possessions began to possess him. You see, my friend, it is not, there is nothing wrong with driving a nice car. There is nothing wrong with living in a nice house. There is nothing wrong with having a great job. There is nothing wrong with making a lot of money. There is nothing wrong with being rich. I believe God wants you to prosper in every way. John said, beloved, above all things, I pray that you would prosper. God does want you to prosper. How many believe that? We cannot live in this mentality that, oh, poor me, poor me. The only way that I can be spiritual is to live in poverty. That's a lie of the devil. I said, that is a lie of the devil. You don't have to live in poverty to be spiritual. You don't have to be without to have the anointing. But it becomes wrong when the possessions that you own begin to own you. It becomes wrong when you place your job above the house of God. When you begin to say, I've got to work so many hours, I can't go to God's house anymore. Let me tell you, your job is not more important than the presence of Almighty God. And if you've got to cut your hours and you've got to cut your budget, you need to do it because the house of God must take priority over everything. I really believe that so many people are missing out on the blessing of God because they are so focused on the riches and the pleasures of this life. Nothing wrong with riches, but when riches begin to rule you, that's when it becomes wrong. Can I speak to something here this morning? There might be some of you that you pay all of your bills. You pay the cable bill. You pay uh, the, the trash bill. You pay, you go out to eat. You do all of these things, and then it comes to Sunday, and you have no money for tithe and offering. God, you understand Xfinity is not cheap, and it's March Madness, and I've got to watch the NCAA tournament. Lord, you understand i got to have Applebee's. i got to have my boneless wing fix. Lord, you know God does not understand. God said, bring the tithe to the storehouse. And the moment that you get a paycheck is the moment that before Xfinity, Applebee's, or your ex-husband, or whoever it might be, gets paid, you say, Lord, this is the 10% that will not be touched by anything else. And I'm bringing it, and I'm planting it into the storehouse. Let me tell you something, church. When we begin to let our possessions be submitted to the will of God, God is going to bless and bring increase. First John 2, 16, the Bible said this, All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but it is of the world. You see, everything that the enemy tries to trip us up with is wound up in these three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the enemy has not changed his tactics. He's used this from the beginning of time. He comes to Eve and he presents to her the fruit and appeals to her fleshly nature. Appeals to her saying, you will become like God if you eat of this fruit. And what the enemy would like to do is to bring to us all of the fleshly appealments of the world around us. Now, church, I'm just going to get right down to brass tacks today. How many believe God wants us to be a holy people? And the enemy will try to appeal to the fleshly nature and say, if you would just be like the world, if you would just act like them, if you would just be like them, you'd get more money, you'd have better relationships, you'd be able to do this. And let me tell you something, amen, I believe God wants us, amen, to say no to every appealment of the world because the world cannot dictate who we are and dominate. We belong to Jesus. He is the Lord of all, the Savior of all, and we belong to him and not to the world, amen. 
You see, any time when it gets into the pride of life, that means I have control. The reason Eve ate of the fruit is because she wanted control. She wanted to be like God. And any time that we begin to eat of the pleasures of this world, something else begins to control us rather than God. And there might be some of you in the sound of my voice that right now, your life is being dominated by alcohol. Your life is being dominated by drugs, legal or illegal. And you now have a life that is being dictated by something else than the Word of God. And can I tell you today that the Lord is saying it's time to lay it aside because today's the day of your deliverance. Amen. God can deliver you from alcohol. He can deliver you from drugs. He can deliver you from absolutely anything that is dominating and dictating who you are or directing your life in the wrong direction. Let me tell you, today is the day of your deliverance. Let me say it again. You will be set free today when you understand I will not let, amen, the thorns of this life and the weeds of this world choke out the word of God. I want freedom. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Number five, Jesus comes then now to what I call the soil of the cultivated heart. He said, verse 15, he said, that on good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart, they've heard the word, and they keep it, and they bring forth fruit with patience. This is the heart that I want. He said it's an honest heart. It's a good heart. And the interesting thing is that both of those words, honest and good, come from the same Greek word, meaning good. But they have two separate meanings. Honest means inherently good, and good means visually good. In other words, what is on the inside is what you see on the outside. There is no duplicity. There is no hypocrisy. But rather, what you see is what you get. Do you ever, do you ever see a commercial for a burger place on television. And isn't it amazing how they make those burgers look so good? I mean, if you would see a Burger King commercial, I mean, they zoom in on the ketchup that is flowing, and that burger looks so juicy. And I'm telling you, the lettuce, man, some of you are getting hungry right now. The lettuce looks like it, man, it's just been picked five minutes ago. And the tomatoes are plump. And, oh, man, that cheese is oozing down. And so you say, I'm going to go get myself a burger from Burger King. It looks so good. And then you show up, and what do you get? It's half the size that you see on television. It's dried up, and the tomatoes came from last week. If you're a Burger King fan, sorry, I just dashed your hopes and dreams. But more times than not, you are disappointed by what you see. Church, let me tell you, I want to get to the point that what you see is what's really inside of me. So I am not living a duplistic life or a hypocritical life. Church, let's take the mask off and let's get real with Jesus again. Let's get back to the point where we say, God, I don't want anything in my heart. I don't mean to preach this morning, but I'm just going to tell you what's on my life. God is saying, rip it off. Rip off the scabs that have been there for years so that the wound can heal and bleed out if it needs to, just so your heart is pure and your mind is pure because God is looking for a church that is without spot and that is without wrinkle and that means from the inside out we are going to be a church that is pure in the sight of almighty God I got to till the garden I remember when I was a kid my dad would always get the tiller out we had a huge garden and the reason we had a huge garden is because my mom and dad they had three employees that never got paid. Me and my two sisters. If 
for you to come at them and say, what about child labor laws? They'd have laughed in your face. Somebody, somebody asked us the other day if we pay our kids for what they do at home. Like my, my daughter, she, she does a lot around the house. And somebody said, well, do you pay her? Yeah, she's got a place to live. I buy shampoo. I buy soap. Sure, I pay her. But my dad was the one that did the tilling. I don't ever remember, maybe she did, I don't remember my mom doing it. I don't know that I ever did it. But when it came time to till the garden, it was my dad that would take the handles of the tiller and would take that tiller and would chew up the ground. And as he chewed up the ground, out of the ground would come rocks, and out of the ground would come weeds, and out of the ground would come anything that would inhibit the seed from being planted deep within the soil. Because until you till the ground, you can't plant the seed. Can I say that again? You're trying to plant seed in ground that is so full of weeds and so full of rocks and so full of junk. It's no wonder you can't make it. It's no wonder you survive a week and a half and then backslide or you're in for three months and then you're out for six months. It's time to plant the seed in ground that has been tilled and nothing is there that's going to choke out the word and the power and the life that it brings. But it was always my dad. It was always my father that was tilling the ground. And the reason I say that is to show you, amen, the one that tills the ground is not somebody that you found in church. It's not a Facebook friend. And it's not, it is the heavenly father that is here ready today to till up the soil of your heart and to chew up the ground of your heart because he wants to plant the seed of his word deep inside of your heart. It's the father that does it. You're trying to let your therapist do it. Oh, come on, somebody. Your therapist can't till the ground like God can. Your therapist can bring up stuff from when you were five years old, but only God can root it out of your life. Your therapist can talk about things that happened to you when you were a teenager, but only God can get it out so that the ground is ready to receive the seed. And I believe that God is tilling our heart. He's cultivating our heart. Now, how does he cultivate our heart? He cultivates our heart by trial and by hard times. I know we don't like to hear that, but the Bible says in the book of Peter, Peter said, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is the same disciple that Jesus turned around and looked at and said, Simon, he said, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Can you give me five minutes and let me tell you something right now? The devil is out to destroy your life, and the enemy is out to sift you. But Jesus said, I prayed for you uh, that your faith would fail not. Uh, In other words, the hard time uh, and the trial that you are going through right now is cultivating some things out of your life uh, that have been buried there. Sometimes uh, they've been buried there for decades uh, and you didn't even realize that they were there. But God is beginning to root it out. uh, And the reason he's beginning to root it out is because there's a work that he's getting ready to do inside of you that is more powerful than you have ever had uh, in the the history of your life. I believe God is ready to plant a seed deep inside of your heart that's going to spring forth fruit that's going to be a hundredfold, more than you could ever imagine. But you've got to let the hard times and the trials root it out so that you can live. Somebody shout amen. How many have seen some trials root some stuff out of your life? How many have seen some hard times root some junk out of your life? 
God cultivates it through hard times. God cultivates it through the life of others. People speak into our life. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Sometimes God's got to send somebody to make you aware of what's going on in your life. Sometimes the Lord has to send somebody with a fresh word that said, hey, brother, hey, sister, I'm seeing something that I want to address in you. And the Lord begins to till. He begins to till. He begins to cultivate. He begins to hoe. He begins to rake. He begins to get the junk out of our heart so that he can plant the seed. And sometimes he cultivates simply by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God comes along and begins to deal and begins to breathe, begins to move upon us. The Bible says in John chapter 16, Jesus said the spirit of truth, when he's come, he's going to guide you into all truth. He won't speak of himself, but whatever he hears, that's what he's going to speak. And he will show you things to come. Today, some of you are going through the cultivating process. But I want you to understand something. The cultivating is good because God's getting ready to plant the seed. I said the cultivating is good because God's getting ready to plant the seed. And as he plants the seed, there's going to be fruit that begins to grow within your life. Some of you have a heart that is being dominated by drugs. It's being dominated by alcohol. It's being dominated by the things of this world. And God is saying, I want to set you free today. I want you to walk out of this place with liberty and, oh, my God, I feel the Spirit of the Lord right now. I want you to walk out of this place with freedom and liberty that nothing is ever going to die. I don't care how long you have been addicted. You can be set free in a moment's time when the Spirit of God touches your life and sets you free. It doesn't matter what the devil has convinced you that you've got to have another drink. Amen. You can be dried up and sober today by the Spirit of the living God that comes upon you. But you've got to have a heart that's ready to receive the word. And I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what you're going through right now. But my prayer is that you have a heart that is cultivated. You have a heart that is soft. You have a heart that is pliable. Oh, Jesus. Stand to your feet right now.